Hey guys, welcome back to Medical Coding with Blue. It is Q&A Tuesday. So if you're brand new to my channel, welcome. I am Blue, I'm a medical coder. I have been a medical coder for over 10 years. I like sharing the things that I know, so I hope that you'll hit that subscribe button. I hope that you'll hit the thumbs up button. And if this video helps you at the end, I hope you'll share it. Okay, so let's get started. So Q&A Tuesday, what is Q&A Tuesday? This is the show where I combine all of the questions that I get from Instagram. Uh, video messages and email and I put it all into one episode and here we go. So let's get started. All right. The first question is uh, Thank you blue for such a valuable information for medical coder exam preparations Your video was full of inspiration and you draw a real picture for coding exam preparation. I am, am waiting of your videos I'm I copied exactly the comment. Okay, um I am waiting of your videos in which you will tell us about advanced preparation for coding exams. And I, and I asked him, you know, well, what do you mean by advanced preparation for coding exams? And he, and he says, um, I mean that you have told us about the base for medical coding, such as anatomy, physiology, medical terminology, pharmacology. And now I am expecting from you uh, a practical of applying codes on patient details. I personally feel that I am still unaware of the coding part. So uh, I will give you a little bit of background on this this um, viewer. They've commented quite a few times. I don't really think that they're actually in a program itself. I think they're trying to do independent study. Here's the thing. Okay. Uh, I can give you guys tips and I am happy to give you guys tips. Uh, that, that is the premise of this channel is to give you guys some tips, right? From what, from me to you, right? However, I can't give you my knowledge without you actually doing the heavy lifting too. So I don't know what the deal is. If you feel like you're this lost, uh, if you're this lost then you need to go through a program. You don't need to be trying to study on your own. You, yes, you can learn medical coding on your own. Uh, it is possible. But if you feel this lost, you are still going to continue to spin your wheels uh, if you don't have somebody instructing you. I do have a Patreon channel only because I did do exercises before. I did coding exercises before called Quiz Friday and I had Answered Monday. There were 35 of those episodes. 35. And the average was not even a hundred views on those videos. So those views, those videos were not getting the views. Okay. This is, this is the part of the reason that I stopped doing them because nobody was watching them. Why would I put something out on my channel that nobody is watching? If you've taken the time to go through my videos, you'll see them. And there's even a playlist that has the episode with the answer corresponding video with it. If you want to look through those, great. Uh, if you want to look through my back, back to the basics, I also have that as well. Uh, these are just back to the basics. These are the basic fundamental starting points of medical coding. I can't give you guys my knowledge without you doing the heavy lifting as well. Uh, if you want actual uh, continual practice exercises, I do them on my Patreon channel. That is where I exclusively do them now because of the simple fact that I think that I'm, I don't want to waste my time with something that you guys are not watching. These episodes that, that I do for um, the coding exercises, they take hours to do. This is not where I can just sit in front of the camera and be like talking for 30 minutes about a subject. It's not like that. Those episodes where I'm actually talking about coding and breaking it down, they take hours to put together just the lesson part of it. That's not the shooting part of it where I actually have to like show you guys something. It's not like, that's not the breakdown part of it. That doesn't, that's another hour of, of prep time to do the uh, prep for, you know, breaking it down on video. So that's why I put everything on Patreon because in Patreon, I know that those people are exclusively wanting exclusive content. And so that's why I do it there. Um, again, if you are that lost when it comes to coding, then you need to go through a program and you don't need to be trying to do it on your own. There's just some things that you have to accept. Either you're going to go through a program or you're not, you know, and again, I will help you guys as much as you're trying to help yourself. Uh, but in the instance of this one, it's, it's not, you're, if you're not doing the heavy lifting, there's really nothing I can do to help you. Okay. So that's my answer on that one. The next one is, 
How is the exam format? Is it multiple choice or fill in the blank or questions or what? So it depends on what uh, association you're going through. Uh, you can get exam prep books and that's how you can know what the format is. I don't know what the format is for every single coding exam, which is why I will not comment on that. Um, but if you look up the uh, exam preparation on ahima.org or aapc.com, it will let you know, okay? Next one is, how do you take care of your eye health if you are always in the books and software? It's the same way as if you would be doing any other job. You just take care of yourself. I give my eyes breaks. I don't continually stare at uh, the books. I don't continually stare at the computer screen. I do give my eyes breaks. I look around, I look up, you know, uh, I, I eat healthy, you know, as far as like eating foods that are, are healthy for my eyes, you know, so I mean, there's, there's a bunch of ways to do it. It's not all about eye strain, okay? Uh, next question, I enjoy your videos. <laughs> I'm guessing you're, you are Filipino. You speak very fluent English. <laughs> Did you go to school for that English fluency? I am trying to improve my English communication. What would you recommend? Thank you for your reply. So I am not Filipino, actually. I get that question a lot, but no, I am not Filipino. Uh, what I would suggest if you want to really work on your speech and how you sound and your fluency, uh, I would really suggest looking at the accent coaches uh, that are on YouTube. They have a lot of those where it'll help you to get rid of your accent if you have a real thick accent. And I don't want to say, I'm not saying this to hurt your feelings, okay? So I, I know I probably earned a few thumbs down for that one. But here's the thing. I'm telling you because I care, all right? When you are speaking with doctors, other, other really educated, highly educated people, you need to make sure that what you're saying is clear so that they fully understand. When it comes to medical coding, you'll find a lot of doctors will get very frustrated because they don't understand it. They don't care about the billing. They don't want to know. Don't tell them. They, they, it just aggravates them. Here's the thing. And if you go there and you have a real thick accent or people can't really understand you very well, it's going to make it even more frustrating. So this is why I say you need to learn to speak clearly and you need to learn to speak fluently. So even if you do have a thick accent, you can still work on it. I don't understand why if you have a thick accent, you're not willing to want to work on it. Everybody needs to work on something. There's a ton of things that I know I still need to work on and I try to work on them all the time. So that's another thing that I got to tell you guys. If, if I'm telling you something, it's because I actually do care and I want you to be successful. And I want you to be successful in your communication. And I want you to be successful in your studies with medical coding. I tell you these things because these are the things that I've learned from. And it's not just so that I can, I can try to insult anybody because I'm not. You know, and if you take it that way, well, then you're wrong because that's not what I'm doing. I'm just saying that if you want to learn how to speak fluently, then you've got to really start to learn how to incorporate your hearing with what you're speaking. And you can do that with, you know, accent coaches and with um, dialect and things like that. That way you can learn how to start speaking. And even if you're listening to something and you have to mimic how it sounds, it will help you when you're speaking. So I'm just saying, that's my advice. Next question. Hi, Blue. For someone seeking to build a career in medical records field, what programs should they study in school? Is it health information management, health information technology, or medical records? And what level should they start at? Is a certificate, associate's degree, or bachelor's degree? Sorry, but I am very new to this field and I don't know how to navigate. Thank you. To this comment, I hand-selected four videos from my collection, four. And I posted them all. I said, please see this one, please see this one, please see this one. It addressed every single one, one of their questions, right? A couple of minutes later, like within three minutes, they, they come back and they post, thanks Blue for the helpful contents. If someone wants to build a career in medical records and wants to be very competitive in that field, what advice would you give them with respect to A, what program should they study in school? B, what level should they start at? Certificate, diploma, or associate's degree, etc. C, how quickly progress 
up the job ladder in that field. Your help would be greatly appreciated. Thanks so much. Here's the deal. If I personally hand selected videos for you and I posted to your comment, you need to watch that video. Now I'm not doing this to promote my videos. I'm doing this because whatever you asked me, I've already addressed it in that video. I have a lot of videos. I have probably like almost 300, a little over 300 videos now and I get it. So you don't want to have to go through all those videos. If you ask me and I give you, if I give you the specific video and a comment and I tell you, please watch this video, please watch the video because to me, it's a little bit disrespectful if I've already done that. And then you come back within minutes and ask me the same questions over again. Now I am very responsive to questions. I ask you guys all the time to be detailed with your questions. And I ask, I have you ask very specific questions. These are examples of very general questions. I've answered these questions before. And if you say, well, blue, they're just asking. Okay, exactly. And that's why I gave you the video. So if I gave you the video, then you need to do your part and look at the video. I'm not going to sit here and answer a question over again after I've already answered it in detail in these videos. Okay. So again, I'm just trying to help you and I'm just trying to, you know, give you some guidance, you know, and I, and I responded to this, I responded to that person to please watch the videos because I answer all of their questions in those videos and even maybe some questions that they didn't even know they had. You know, so again, if I'm doing that, if I'm taking the time, then you all need to take the time in return and watch the videos like I ask. Okay. Uh, because I'm just trying to help you just saying next question. How long did it take you to find your first job? It took me two months. It took me two months of tail busting hard work, two months. <laughs> it is not easy guys in the beginning to find a job it's a brand new medical coder it's not easy it it will your ego will take a bruising okay you will take uh, an emotional roller coaster that's what it is in the beginning and it will make you fight for it medical coding will make you fight for it in the beginning I'm not gonna lie and I've always been truthful about that um, I ended up getting my first job by going through a temporary agency that specialized in medical jobs and so because of that, uh, that was how I ended up getting my first assignment. And then my first assignment lasted for three months. And then when it ended, uh, they told me that either we have another position, but it is eight hours away from your hometown. Uh, you can take it or you can sit here with no job. And I took it. You know, I didn't want to take it, uh, but I mean, I had to in order to get the experience that I needed. And um, if I hadn't taken it, I mean, obviously I wouldn't even be here today. This is, this is uh, after I had that job where I moved, I moved here to my current uh, place that I'm at and I've been here ever since. So I've been here uh, a little over 11 years, a little over 10 years now. And so um, this year is 11 years. So, you know, it's, it's actually, it is 11 years. <laughs> I just passed it. Uh, yeah, it's 11 years now that I've been here. So, I mean, I really enjoy, I enjoy being here. I mean, I've learned a lot from my time here. I know that this is not just where, you know, my career is, you know what I mean? This is, this is a continuation of my career. There's going to be a lot more to what I have in store and what I have planned. So I'm just saying, but yes, it does take time. Uh, not everybody gets as lucky to get um, a job in two months. Some people it takes six months and some people it takes a few years. Uh, but it depends on how diligent you are in your job search. It depends on how, how, how stubborn you are. You have to keep applying. Uh, and even if they ask for experience, you still have to go ahead and apply anyway. Uh, this really does apply to places that you actually have to physically go to if you are trying to do this and you want to be a remote medical coder. It's not going to happen. And I'm just telling you guys that, to be honest with you, and not to discourage you or anything. Uh, a lot of people get mad. There's nothing I can do. I don't make the rules, but I'm just telling you that if you're brand new, you're going to want to be in a place. Now, of course, with COVID going on, the game has changed a little bit. So I don't really know um, as far as like, you know, when you are applying that it is like normally like where you go to, but they're having everybody work at home. You know what I mean? That's something completely different. If they're going to work with you, then that's something completely separate. But I just want you guys to be aware of what it normally is, you know, during normal times. So 
Yes, <laughs> that answers that question. Uh, next question, do employers look at your school GPA? Probably not. Um, I don't think that that would be a, a big deal if you have a, your credential. Um, if, if you have your degree, that's something different. Maybe they might look at it then. Uh, I really don't think so. I've never really heard of that, but you never know. Uh, but as far as if you went with your credential, no. No, they're not looking at that. All they care about is can you pass their initial assessment and can you code? That's all they care about, you know, and, and that you're credentialed. Next question. Is there a high turnover rate in medical coding? So it depends. It depends on a few things. It depends on the coder themselves, how they are applying themselves. That's number one. If you are not applying yourself and if you are not trying to make uh, a better understanding of medical coding for yourself and you're very lost and you don't do very well on your audits, um, audits are a normal part of a medical coder's career. We get them every single month. Some places, uh, they're lucky and they get them every quarter. You know what I mean? I would prefer them every quarter, but <laughs> whatever, you know, um, it just depends. If you're not doing so well on your audits and you start failing and you're not applying yourself to try to learn more, then you have an issue, then you can get let go. Uh, but obviously this is going to be after some time and they have to work with you and they have to try to get you going in the right direction. And, and then as far as like the uh, leadership goes, sometimes, you know, the expression that people don't leave their jobs because they don't like it. They leave it for, because of bad management. It, it, I mean, it's, it's everywhere you go. If you have a bad leadership, obviously you're not going to want to be around, you know, people that are in, you know, doing bad leadership. I was under a bad leader for 18 months. 18 months and I remember it and it was not fun. It was misery and it really made me question what was I doing? Did I want to be in such a miserable uh, position? I did not want to be in such a miserable position because I really love coding but I did not like being under a, a um, leader and I say leader because when you behave the way that this person did this is not leadership. Okay and so for me I've always wanted to learn from that. I've always wanted to say if I ever get into a position that is leadership like that, that I would never, ever be that way, in which I don't think I could ever be that way. I could never, ever be the way that that person was. And again, so that would be the only reason that somebody would leave um, a medical coding job for something else. I have heard of people that uh, did leave for other reasons because of other people uh, in their leadership in their leadership line. Not everybody has the same leadership line. Um, I had an alarm on, <laughs> uh, you know, it just depends. It depends on, you know, where you are and what you're doing. But sometimes if you do have a bad leader, sometimes it is just a matter of working with that person. And that person is, is, working with you to help you grow. You know, that's what happens. And especially when you can recognize it and when you've had like leadership training, I went through the Arbinger Institute and ever since then, it really did change my perspective on how I viewed things. However, I will say the Arbinger Institute helped me to, to change how I looked at things, but it did not change how uh, this person was to me, which this person, this, this leader that I had was, like I said, was one of the most difficult ones I've ever had to be around. And so because of that, you know, I, I, if I had another position to choose, then at the time I probably would have, you know, gone to something else if I did not have the steadfast attitude that I do have, which I do have a steadfast attitude. You, you're not going to sit here and try to run me out of my job. Not going to do it. So when I had my 10 year anniversary um, last year, you know, she had actually <laughs> messaged me and she was like, oh, congratulations, Blue. Uh, congratulations on your 10 years. And I was like, hmm, OK. And she copied my boss on this email. <laughs> Whatever. If you are genuinely being genuine in your congratulatory remarks to somebody, you will send it directly to that person. You're not going to sit here and try to copy everybody and make it look like, you know, you're really, you know, uh, uh, a caring leader because that that does not make you that 
I'm just saying. But yeah, that would be the only reason why it would be a high turnover. So just watch your accuracy, watch your production, and you'll be fine. You know, other than that, you know, just have fun with it. Have fun with being a coder. Okay. Next question. Is it possible that you can volunteer at a place as an unpaid intern if that place will allow it? So a lot of times those positions come very few and far in between only because you do have to go through a background check if, you, if you're going to volunteer um, because we work with such in sensitive information. You have to be able to pass a background check. Um, they have to know that the information is going to be safe with you. But yes, yeah, sometimes it is possible. You just have to contact the um, like the patient administration division supervisor. Uh, that's usually who's the one who's going to be in charge of doing all of those things. And just tell them that, you know, you are perhaps in a program right now uh, for medical coding and you wanted to see if you can get some experience uh, with volunteering or something, you know, that kind of thing. Or you can try to apply to be in the medical records department and medical records will get you around those people that are um, going to be doing the hiring for the coders. So that way you can make those connections. Then you can also try to apply with medical billing because you do not have to be certified to be a medical biller. I'm just saying. Next question. Can you only be certified in inpatient or outpatient? You can actually be certified as both. It just depends on where you're training, you know, and what kind of training you, you're getting. Uh, with AHEMA, you have to go through uh, the CCS. Uh, the CCS is a certified coding specialist, and that says that you can code both inpatient and outpatient. Uh, they have a program that you have to go through. They have specific educational requirements that you have to meet in order to get that credential. So a lot of times it's going to include you taking their program specifically. Uh, you can go to ahima.org for more information. I'll be leaving the links for these down in the description box below. With AAPC, they have the CPC, which is for the outpatient side, and they have the CIC, which is a certified inpatient coder. Now, before you think, well, I would have to have two credentials with AAPC and only one with, with AHIMA, doesn't the two make me look better? No, actually, it doesn't. Uh, it has no bearing, honestly, uh, because it just it's just literally saying outpatient and inpatient. With the CCS, I've always said this is the gold standard of medical coding credentials, and I stand behind that because I truly do believe it. The CCS is telling everybody in this one credential that you can code both inpatient and outpatient, that you are a versatile coder. With AAPC, you have the two credentials. It really doesn't make a difference, but I'm just saying that because sometimes people think that if they have multiple credentials, they can make more money. No, that's not true. The only way that you're going to be able to, to do all these things is to be able to put your time in. You need to start putting your time in. And a lot of people go their entire careers with only one credential. So uh, whether, and they still make good money. So whether you make, you, whether you have multiple credentials or a single credential, it really doesn't matter. You know, you just have to know what you're doing. Okay. And finally, I tried to sign up for the student AHIMA membership but it kind of makes it seem like you have to be enrolled in an actual program somewhere. Yes, if you want to get the AHIMA student membership um, for their association, you have to be enrolled in an approved AHIMA program for that. Um, and and they'll, you'll be able to find if it is approved on the website. Uh, but yes, that's the only way you can get that discounted uh, program rate. Because <laughs> trust me, it's a lot of savings, you know, if you can get into that kind of program. But yes, that is that is the only way you're going to be able to get that. Other than that, you have to get the regular membership. Uh, the premier membership is if you are um, if you if you want to have the added benefits of the other things that it's it's offering. So uh, I would just recommend the standard membership if you are just in a program somewhere that's not a HEMA approved, but you want to be a member of the association. Um, I would just go with the standard membership. OK, so uh, that's going to wrap it up. Those are all the questions for today. I will leave all of the links for uh, my Patreon, for my Instagram, for my email address for AHIMA and AAPC down in the description box below. So if you have any questions on any of those things, you can check them out. All right. Uh, so if you are a medical coder, a medical coding student, somebody curious about the fascinating world of medical coding, a provider or a nurse, I invite you to like and subscribe and follow me on my journey in medical coding. I will see y'all next time. Bye.